Hello and welcome to Online Church here at St. Jude's Randwick. My name is Andrew Schmidt and I'm really glad that you're able to join us for Online Church today. We're finishing a series in the letter to the Hebrews today after a very long trip through this very important New Testament letter. I'm excited about what I've learned as I've prepared this sermon. I'm energized about pastoring you and I hope that you will really enjoy what I've got to share, which does touch on this issue of what it means to be a Christian pastor and what it means to really want to, to be pastored, uh, not only by our earthly pastor, but indeed by the Lord Jesus himself. It's also Father's Day today, and so happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. I hope you, everyone here has a chance to honour the fathers and father figures in their lives today and we'll be praying for the dads and the father figures in the service. Just to let you know what's happening next week, our online service will be a little bit different. Uh, I've been wanting for some time to uh, make one of our services a morning prayer service because there are wonderful prayers and readings that are slightly different from uh, what's used in the communion service. Uh, so next week we're going to be having morning prayer as our recorded service on YouTube. I hope you can join us for that. You won't need to bring your uh, bread and wine with you uh, to the screen that week. It'll be a wonderful service of morning prayer. Well, each year here at St. Jude's, I uh, recommend and encourage uh, our congregation members to go along to the New College Lectures, uh, which are held at New College at the University of New South Wales, where they invite each year a Christian speaker to speak on something which is uh, topical. Now this year, the lectures are being delivered by Professor Patrick Parkinson, who actually lectured me at Sydney Law School, so I can recommend him very highly. He's speaking on family and faith uh, in a multicultural society. Uh, be very relevant and interesting talks. I've already booked in to go to the first one on Tuesday the 22nd of September, so I do recommend that, and you can see the bulletin for more details. Finally, I just want to say, if so far you've only connected with us uh, online uh, and you haven't been to church in person yet or maybe you're a regular member who hasn't managed to make it back to St Jude's in person just yet I just want to say I'm really looking forward to the chance that you have to do that uh, if you are someone who's connected online either nearby or from far afield please do uh, let us know how much you've enjoyed the service you can uh, connect with us using our online connect card and you can find a link to that in the description of this video on YouTube. Well, let's go into church. The Lord be with you. Psalm 119, verse 137. You are righteous, Lord, and right are your judgments. Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets.
knowing that we do pray to a merciful God, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, confident in God's forgiveness. Merciful God, our Maker and our Judge, we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all who with hearty repentance and true faith turn to him. Have mercy on you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. set for today. Lord, we pray, absolve your people from their offences, that through your bountiful goodness we may be set free from the chains of those sins which in our frailty we have committed. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. The epistle reading is taken from Hebrews chapter 13, beginning at verse 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority, because they give watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so their work may be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Pray for us. We are sure that we have a clear conscience and desire to live honourably in every way. I particularly urge you to pray that I may be restored to you soon. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I urge you to bear with my word of exhortation, for in fact I have written to you quite briefly. I want you to know that our brother Timothy has been released. If he arrives soon, I will come with him to see you. Greet all your leaders and all the Lord's people. Those from Italy send you their greetings. Grace be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's psalm is Psalm 95, the psalm which is set for morning prayer every single day of the year. The reason it's chosen is because of its heartfelt warning 
Today, if you hear the Lord's voice, do not harden your hearts. Let's say the psalm together. O come, let us sing out to the Lord. Let us shout in triumph to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his face with thanksgiving. And cry out to him joyfully in psalms. For the Lord is a great God. And a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. And the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, and he made it. His hands moulded dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. And kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah. As on that day in Massa in the wilderness, when your forebears tested me, put me to proof that they had seen my works. Forty years long I loathed that generation and said, It is a people who err in their hearts, for they do not know my ways. Of whom I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Glory to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as in the beginning, so now and forever. Amen. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew chapter 11 beginning at verse 20. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of the miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to you this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. At that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to the little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified on the Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, 
and the sink of your heart that I meant. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. of the letter to the Hebrews. We've read from this letter every week almost since June and for much of last year as well. And this letter reminds us over and over again that what God has achieved for us through his son Jesus Christ is so magnificent. A better priest, a better sacrifice, a better covenant, a better gathering, that we had better not refuse it. Because this is the best and only word of salvation that God has for his world, Jesus Christ. So we're encouraged to be thankful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And as it says at the end of chapter 12, to offer acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Now, chapter 13 paints a picture of that acceptable worship and of the community that's built up when Christians offer acceptable worship together. It creates a community of brotherly love, of hospitality, generosity, of holding fast to the Lord Jesus who never changes. Now here in the passage that was read for today, Hebrews chapter 13 verses 17 to 25, he touches on the question of how the local church should treat its leaders. Now, as the leader, it's always awkward to expound a passage that says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. Uh, but it's also really good and helpful for me to have read and studied this passage and to be preparing today to explain it to you because it reminds me of what my job is. It enables a refocus on what is the most important task of the pastor. And in fact, as, I, as I've studied and reflected this week, it's got me excited again about the task of the pastor and, and to invite you afresh to let me be your pastor. The passage is going to go on in verses 20 to 21 to speak of the great pastor, the great shepherd, Jesus Christ, and to ask, is he your pastor? 
I wonder what you would see as the most important task of the pastor. Is it to run a great service? Is it to visit the sick? Is it to include a funny story in every sermon? Or is it, as it seems to have been in COVID season, to be a film producer? Well, verse 17 says, to have confidence in your leaders and submit to them because, now here's the reason, they are keeping watch over you, literally over your souls, as those who must give an account. Interestingly, the reason he gives for submitting to the pastor's authority is not because the pastor's better than you and not because they know more, although hopefully they'll be a person who's been well-trained and well-chosen. But no, that's not the reason why to submit to them. It's, it's because they have been given a responsibility by God to watch over your souls, and they will give an account. This is teaching that I and everyone who puts up their hand to be a pastor will have to answer to God for the souls that were in our care. I can tell you that that is a sobering fact. Bishop Michael Stead spoke about this at my installation here nearly four years ago from the book of Ezekiel. He warned me that I'm a watchman and my task is to warn people. If I've warned people and they don't listen, well, I'm free of my responsibility. But if I didn't warn people, then their blood is on my hands. Now, it should be clear yet again that something infinitely serious is going on here. We're speaking about eternal salvation. Now, if there were no God and no life after death, then no one would need a pastor. We would still need teachers and police and health officials, but no one would need a pastor. If it were the case that everyone gets to heaven, well, again, no one would need a pastor. I certainly wouldn't be doing it. But since there is a God and heaven and hell are real, and Satan, who is trying to trick us and lure us away from the salvation that's to be found in Jesus Christ is also real, then everyone needs a pastor. You do need someone who is losing sleep over your eternal soul. The only question really is whether we want a pastor, whether we want someone who will take an interest in our eternal well-being and, I guess, be on our case about it. My mother-in-law once said something interesting to me. She said that now she's older, she really likes to receive a phone call from her pastor. But when she was younger and in the thick of motherhood and family life, she didn't want a call from the pastor. She felt that he'd be checking up or that she must have done something wrong or that he had some job for her to do. Now, I can fully understand that, actually. But when you think about it, to receive a phone call from someone who is losing sleep over your eternal soul, what a gift. Hebrews is not suggesting a, a, a really hierarchical, a sort of authoritarian church government here. He's not suggesting anything like the Roman Catholic priesthood with its power to create doctrine. New Testament churches had a fairly flat authority structure. They were simply groups of Christians who were gathering together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be instructed from the scriptures and to give encouragement to one another. And that is all that a church needs to be today. It's just a group of Christians getting together in the name of Jesus. But groups of human beings do need leadership. And actually, as I'm sure you've observed when you've been in groups of different sorts, when there is no appointed leader, leadership just happens spontaneously, doesn't it? Someone will take the lead and will lead people somewhere. 
Uh, do you know that people who've observed the behaviour of sheep can tell us that the leader of a flock of sheep is often simply the first one to move? Leadership is going to happen whether we like it or not. That's why the New Testament always assumes and encourages that churches will have leaders, leaders who are well-trained, well-chosen, and suitable for the task. And so he says, because your pastor is keeping watch over your soul, have confidence in them and submit to their authority and make their job a joy. How to make your pastor's job a joy? Well, here are a few thoughts. Uh, first of all, come to church. When the pastor says, we're gathering, gather. It's wonderful encouragement to see people gathering here in the name of Jesus. Uh, and it also makes the pastor's job easier because it makes it easier to have contact with the people over whom I'm losing sleep. Second, be open to changing your mind under the influence of God's word. See, it's the Psalm 95 thing. Today we read Psalm 95. Today when you hear his word, do not harden your hearts. Please, when you hear God's word, do not harden your hearts. See, the, the main thing that I do is teach God's word. And so I want you to be open to that. Really engage with what is taught and be open to changing your mind. I think that the more authoritarian the leadership, the more that you might get surface level compliance, but without real engagement. Now, I really can't see the point of, of that at all. Uh, I do this because I want to change people's lives. So I, I don't at all want people to comply on the surface, but, but not to have changed hearts. That would be a waste of everyone's time. I guess what I'm saying is I want to be the agent by which Jesus changes your hearts. As he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, he's changing us from glory into glory as we gaze on the face of his son, Jesus Christ. Well, verse 18 continues the flow of thought. He says, pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience. The writer himself, of course, is also pastoring the Hebrews. Uh, he sees them himself as, as pastoring them. And he, he says, if you want to make your pastor's job a joy, he says, pray for me, pray for us. Now, I've got to say, it would bring me enormous joy to know that you are praying for me and for our whole ministry team here, because that is one of the ways that we all join together in the work of the gospel, by praying for those who are engaged in the work of the gospel. I think it's interesting that he links up pray for us with I've got a clear conscience. And I think that the thought process is this. As far as my conscience tells me, I'm doing what's right, and I'm doing my best. So if there's something wrong, if there's something wrong with the way that I'm pastoring, you'd better ask God to show me. It's very common these days that if you disagree with someone, you simply smear them as a person with bad motives. Just this week, at one point on Wednesday, I happened to glance at the Sydney Morning Herald uh, website, and the leading article at that particular time uh, was a headline, he's a misogynist, uh, said about Tony Abbott. Now, I don't particularly want to comment on that individual instance, but you see, it's, a, it's an example of what goes on in our society, isn't it? Uh, see, the minute that you say about someone, oh, their motives are bad, the minute you, you say about someone that they're a misogynist or a racist or whatever it might be, you no longer have to think seriously about what they're saying. You've saved yourself a lot of mental hard work by giving that person a label. You've also missed out on the opportunity to have your own viewpoint challenged 
maybe not revolutionised, but at least challenged, at least sharpened up. It would help a lot in our world for understanding between Christian and non-Christian, for understanding between left and right, and for what understanding between whatever other divide might be out there, if we could start with the presumption that everyone is acting in good conscience. The writer to the Hebrews, as a pastor and a Christian leader, says, I have got a clear conscience. And I'll tell you what, you really want your pastor to have a clear conscience. You really want someone who is ministering in accordance with their own convictions. So uh, this is a personal statement from me. If you were ever to disagree with me, not that that would ever happen, it's very important that you have confidence, and you can have confidence in this, that I am acting in good conscience, shaped by my convictions from the Word of God. So please do pray for me and the whole ministry team here that we might continue ministering according to a conscience that is shaped by the Word of God. Hebrews goes on in verse 19 to ask them especially to pray that he might be restored to them soon. And so here we start to understand a bit of the, the, the backstory to this very letter, the, the, the ministry situation that it came out of. Evidently, the writer is away from the congregation. He's possibly in prison or perhaps he's simply on a mission trip. Uh, somehow he's been delayed away from the congregation. We can't know and indeed we, we don't even know who the author is. But we know that as he writes this letter, he wants to be with them. He wants to be physically present with them. And I think that in this COVID season, it's worth saying that while the internet has been a huge blessing to Christian fellowship over the last six months, in-person gathering still is the original and the best form of Christian fellowship. Because you get to see others who have taken the time to, to gather in the name of Christ. You get encouragement from that. And it just makes it a little bit easier to have personal contact with the person who is striving to care for your eternal soul. Indeed, with the whole congregation of brothers and sisters who are striving for their own and for your eternal soul. This passage today has helped me, and I hope us, to refresh ourselves on the purpose of church. It is primarily so that this shepherding can take place to keep us on track in our Christian lives, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus and on the kingdom that cannot be shaken, which he is giving to us. And so now in verses 20 to 21, we get a reminder, just in case we were prone to forget, that this is not all about our earthly gathering and our earthly pastor. Because an earthly pastor is simply a poor servant of the great pastor, the great shepherd. The Lord Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. Verse 20. Now I've got no doubt that the reason he calls Jesus the shepherd here is because he has been talking about pastoring. Now, I've urged you today to see that you need a pastor. And I think I'm inviting you to let me and, and the ministry team here at St. Jude's pastor you. But the great pastor is Jesus himself. And so when you're a Christian and taking part in church life and doing your best to have confidence in your earthly pastor, the great news is that the great pastor is at work in you. And he will equip you with everything good for doing his will. He wants you to do what's pleasing to him. And he's working towards that. If he gave his life that you might live, then you know that he cares. So you want your pastor to care about you, don't you? You know that Jesus cares about you. And if God brought Jesus back from the dead, 
then you know that he has the power to achieve his plans. Even his plans in you. If you know that you need a pastor, and you do need a pastor, then by trusting in Jesus Christ, you have him as your great shepherd, your great pastor. I can't resist telling you this story. It's a saying from an older medical doctor to a young doctor. And he says, listen, in medicine, half of your patients, you won't be able to help them. And the other half will get better anyway. Now, I'm sure it's an exaggeration. Doctors make a great deal of difference to many lives. But there's also a truth in it, because often, and this is no matter what our job is, we can be working hard and yet we can feel almost like a spectator as things happen around us that we weren't able to have a big influence on. Pastoring can be a little bit like that. But not for the great shepherd. He has died and risen. He cares about you. And he is powerful. He can and will save and keep his people for the kingdom that cannot be shaken. You need him as your pastor. And Jesus here in his word to us in the Hebrews, he urges us to have confidence in our earthly pastors, to pray for them, to make their job a joy by being open to be changed by God's word. Now I've been challenged afresh as I prepared this sermon to be losing sleep over your eternal souls. I'm continuing to pray for you and I'm looking forward to seeing you in person here at church sometime soon. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you that you raise from the dead our great shepherd, your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving him to us as our great pastor. Thank you that we know he cares about us and is powerful to equip us to do your will. And Father, here at St. Jude's, uh, we ask you to strengthen us as we go about church life. Uh, please help me and all the pastors and everyone in any form of leadership uh, really to care, to pray, and to be losing sleep over the eternal souls of those whom you have entrusted to us. And please, Father, we pray that we might be a church where people have confidence in their leaders and are open to be changed by your powerful word. We pray in your Son's name. Amen. Let us pray for all people and the church throughout the world. Most loving God, you have given us this new day in which to serve you. By your spirit, help us to do so as your precious children, called to be sisters and brothers of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we gather and pray this morning. Gracious Father, as we celebrate Father's Day today, we thank you for the way you have designed family life, and we especially pray for fathers and the caring role that they fulfil. Give them abundant patience, wisdom and love for the children in their care. May they build strong bonds and give positive guidance, so enabling young people to grow into loving adults. We ask you to comfort those who are grieving the loss of their fathers and for those who have never known their fathers. May they come close to you, Lord, their heavenly Father. Spirit of Justice, we know that Randwick Council plays an important role providing smooth running of our lives through all their facilities. Please help them to perform their duties with energy and fairness. Protect them from corruption and through their work make Randwick a secure and well-maintained place to live. God of mercy, please hear our prayers for all those who are homeless or living in poverty. We pray for vagrants who sleep in the streets, those in hostels or temporary accommodation, those young people who have left their homes or who can't pay their rent or mortgage. 
Please bring them hope, bring them shelter, bring them someone to care for them. Please, Lord, provide resources so that all may have somewhere to call home. God of truth, we thank you for the provision of Moore College as it trains men and women for a lifetime of discipleship and disciple-making. We ask that both students and staff will grow in the knowledge of you and in humility and service towards others. May each member of the college work together under your direction so that the college functions well and the endeavours of all will bring many people to you. Heavenly Father, your son Jesus brought children to himself and blessed them. We ask you, Lord, to bless the children of St Jude Sunday School, that they may open their hearts and minds to learn about you, and so have their lives transformed. We pray you will move parents and children from the local area to take the opportunity to hear the good news at Sunday School. We heartily thank you for the leadership and the teachers at Sunday School. We pray you will strengthen and sustain them in their precious work. Lord, we look to you knowing that you love and care for us. Please be with all those people who are on our minds today with special difficulties. Surround them with your strong loving arms and sustain them in their time of need. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church that we may be one in Christ. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by everyone. We pray for all bishops, priests and deacons, that they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and exercise authority in the nations of the world, that there may be peace and justice among all. Give us strength to do your will in all that we undertake, that, that we may be blessed in all our works. Have compassion on those who suffer or who are in grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. We praise you for all your saints who have entered into joy. May we also share in your heavenly kingdom. Accept our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hear the words from Scripture. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Let us pray together. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen.
Blessed are you, Lord God our Father. Through your goodness we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. Amen. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. All glory and honour, thanks and praise be yours now and always, Lord, Holy Father, mighty Creator, ever-living God. We give thanks and praise to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and rising to new life, offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Therefore, with the whole company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing And now, Father, we pray that we who receive these your gifts of bread and wine, according to our Saviour's word, may be partakers of his body and blood. For on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, his almighty Father, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup, and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We offer our prayer and praise, Father, in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. one body in Christ. For we all share in the one bread. of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen.
Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were far, still far off, you met us in your Son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love, gave us grace, and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. We who drink this cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep, Keep us in this hope that we have grasped, so we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Amen. peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant equip you with everything good to do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory for ever and ever and the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>